Hello and welcome to Life Questions. I am Bill Harris, your host. Life Questions is a program committed to reviewing viewer questions through the lens of the Bible for solutions. To get to those solutions, we turn to the capable help of local ministers, and I'd like to introduce them to you right now. To begin, we have Pastor Chris Langstaff of Bell Center Church of Christ, followed by Pastor Chris Ewing of County Lion Church, which is in the Herod and Lafayette areas. Next, Pastor Nick, uh, Pastor Nick uh, Vion of the Cross Point Community Church in Lima. And rounding off our panel today is Pastor Ted Bible of St. Mark's United Methodist Church, also of Lima. You know, we had a great discussion last week. I should tell our viewers this too. Great discussion last week on a question that came in from a viewer should we listen to secular music? And you know, we really didn't do that justice. So let's begin by picking up where we left on that. And for you viewers, by the way, if you want to see last week's program, and I certainly encourage you to do so, you can go to YouTube or you can come to our website and you can see last week's program. That'll get you caught up for where we're going to be taking off from today. Now, again, the question, um, should we be listening to secular music? Who wants to start that off? You look like you're the person that's been Okay, <laughs> well, I, I refer the right honorable gentleman to the answer I gave last week. Uh -huh. um, any, anything in moderation, uh, whatever we do, the, the music we listen to, mm -hmm. the, the books that we read, the movies we watch, the video games we play, the list goes on and on. They'll either bring us closer to God or they'll drive us away. And for some people, um, we, we all struggle with different things mm -hmm. and when the music that we listen to, the books we read, when those things begin to take us to a place that takes us away from God, then we, we need to make note of that. And again, like we talked about last week, that's where having the accountability comes in handy because a lot of times we don't see these things. Mm -hmm. We don't notice that we're moving further and further away from God. Uh, that's where we need to have other people around us to kind of bring us back and, and say, listen, what's going on in your life right now that's taking you away from God? And those questions or those, those discussions can be pretty uncomfortable, but they're, they're necessary. I can recall um, counseling a gentleman who was going through some issues and, and he said, well, you know, when I try to calm down, he said, I get in my car, I drive and I listen to, you know, my old rock and roll music. I said, well, so wh wh when you listen to that, where does it take you? Then he begins sharing with me where it takes him. I said, what you need to do is that's not a good place for you. That's mm -hmm. not a good place in your history. You know, that music did not occurred and took you back to places that you shouldn't have been and you don't want to go back to now. So I encourage you to, to listen to Christian music when you're in those kinds of moods. Do something different. Mm -hmm. You know, and so the same could be true for, for all of us. You know, if, if the lyrics of a song will take us back to a place we shouldn't have been, bringing back memories of things that, you know, maybe we shouldn't, we're not so proud of, then maybe we should change the dial when that song comes on. We can still appreciate the music, um, the talents of the individuals performing the music, right? But maybe the lyrics are just not where they need to be for us today or and at any point, and we need to find something else to listen to. L lyrics is a big deal in terms of it the is. controversy surrounding secular music in the church and all that. That's a big deal. Uh, we, well, uh, it's not just lyrics that's of music today. It's lyrics of music going back, you know, for decades. You, know, you can listen yes, to sure. music from the 70s and 60s mm -hmm, that, that, mm -hmm. that will take you places depending upon how old you are, but maybe you just really don't need to go. Yeah, but the, the music do not <laughs> lie to yourself that you only listen to the beat or the rhythm yes. and do not listen to the lyrics. Yeah. You cannot listen to a song without hearing the lyrics also. Yeah. So right. that is something that, um, I, well, I mean, I know I used when I was young as, as a, well, I'm just listening to that. Well, no, you're also hearing the lyrics and that does influence you too. Well, so. the li lyrics of the 70s and 80s uh, it will take you certain places. I would just say that the lyrics of today will get you there quicker, won't mm. they? In mm -hmm. some it's instances, some yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think the the innocence of secular music is no longer there. Like, I mean, you go back and, you know, listen to the Beach Boys or, you know, different things like that, um, which I don't listen to a, a whole lot of, uh, well, I don't listen to secular music, but I don't, when I'm out and about, I don't hear any songs like the innocence um, of just fun. 
um, even in Christian music in the early 2000s, late 90s, had a lot of just, the Christian artists just had songs that were just fun, had nothing to do with Christianity, God, or anything. They were just fun, you know. Um, but we don't, in today's day and age, there's not a whole lot of that. It's always, um, we're in the day, uh, day and ages of um, pushing agendas and messages across. And even in music, you see that. So you just have to be very careful. But I agree with Chris, too. It's whatever you're... Again, whether it's music or what you watch on TV, video games, I mean, if, if, if they're sending the wrong message to you, right. then you probably shouldn't be Yeah, what fruit is it producing in, in your life? Yeah. Right. I was thinking back to uh, youth ministry a few years back, and one of the most interesting questions I got from a teenager was, is there anything neutral? You know, if everything is either going to draw me to God or away from God, is brushing my teeth neutral? Like, what, what does that look like? And it was a really great question. I, I really I stumbled over it for a little bit, but I, what I realized was that time is not neutral. Time is against us. And it's not to say that it's bad to take time to relax or to rest or to enjoy. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I look, go back to the Beatles sometimes, and a lot of their songs are just, you know, fluffy whatever. There's not anything overtly anti-God, and yet it still fills my mind. And, you know, as we're talking about music, all these other song lyrics are filling up my head. And I'm like, okay, so time is against me. My own limitations are against me. What can I do to redeem that time and put things, like Philippians 4 tells us, things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, whatever's worthy of praise. Mm -hmm. I, th I find all of those in Christ. And so while secular music at sometimes may have echoes of the goodness of creation, it's not written with that intention and it's not going to produce in me what you know, throwing myself into God word, God's word will. Should you in your congregations be cautioning parents to guard over, or to look over, I should say, their children to guard and protect them from lyrics of songs that are coming out today that are, Absolutely. That are not Christian? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think one of the great resources that not a lot of parents realize is the plugged in. Yes, um, that's a good one. Uh, If you go there that, uh, to that website, um, and you can look at movies, book reviews. I think they even have music mm -hmm. on there. Um, and parents can know exactly. And they never tell you what you should or shouldn't do. They just say how many curse words are in it. How many, you know, in like a movie, how much nudity is in it. How much violence, how much drug, how much all this. So that then you can make a judgment as a parent for your kid mm -hmm. with all that information. And it, and it is just really a good tool. And so, yeah, parents should be actively parenting their kids because if you do not actively parent your kid, the world will. Somebody will. Yeah. Very well put. Well, let's move on. Uh, you know, another question we got from viewers that we all had some discussion about early on. How did you know you were called into the ministry? Could each of you just give me in short order? How did each of you know you were called into the ministry. You're smiling like you want no. to go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tell my congregation all the time that I am not a pastor, and you know, which has bit me in the butt a few times, and <laughs> and uh, other times it's not. But I actually came across um, a passage, and it really fit my myself very well. And it's in Amos. And Amos and his struggles, and when he's getting um, persecuted by the king and the prophets. Um, and it's accused because he was accused, hey, you're just being a prophet to make money and all these different things. And he says this, he says, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, for I am a herdsman and a, a grower of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. And that's how I really view myself. And I'm a son of a mechanic. I'm not a pastor. I um, am very analytical thinking. And when it talks about call, um, especially I've been at this church for almost 10 years now. And um, I, I, when I think back to the call of this church, I was not looking for it. And so if you're, it's just about hearing God and getting confirmation from others, confirmation through God's word, that is what ministry is. And so I don't want anybody to think, hey, well, what does ministry mean? Well, it's full-time ministry paid for it. No, because if God calls you to be a minister in Honda, working at Honda, then you need to do that. If God calls you to be a missionary, you need to do that. So it's just about hearing God's word. So how I know, how did I know that I was in ministry? 
because two people called me up and said, you need to apply for this job. And I, after the second person, I told my wife, I said, I think I should pray about it. <laughs> and I prayed about it and God said, go. That's how I am where I am. All right, All right. Pastor, how about you? Well, uh, quickly, uh, 10 years in law enforcement, uh, I was a police officer and detective for 10 I years yeah, and I, I, I began to get that holy stirring that there was something else and it eventually ended up with uh, resigning from the police department, selling our house and moving to uh, Kentucky to go to Bible college and every step of the way God just confirmed that this is what this is what I'm calling you to do and it's uh it's been an interesting ride well, ever has, since. Has law enforcement had an impact on your ministry <laughs> training? You, being a police <laughs> officer <laughs> is tremendous preparation for ministry. It really is. Oh, and yeah. like, like we said earlier, you know, God doesn't waste effort. And uh, I, I look at, at my life pre-ministry as preparation. Right. And God was preparing me and getting me ready. And it wasn't a quick process. It was, it was a very lengthy process. Mm -hmm. but, but along the way, God confirmed, this is what I want you to do. And he made things happen that, that defy logic. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, I go back to 1 Timothy 4.14 as far as the, the how, like what does that look like? Um, Paul tells Timothy, don't neglect the gift that you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. So there's a matter of gifting and there's a matter of leadership that is essential in that. And that's, so that's what I found. When I started to get a sense that perhaps I was being called, I needed to find confirmation from leaders about that. Well, yeah, so my journey was uh, well over 25 years. Being a minister is my third career. You know, so I was in banking for 20, 20 years. I, I worked in a university for, for 18 years. And so I kept having this small voice speaking to me that I kept running from. So like last week's question about being in prayer for four years, about get, not getting an answer, I was in prayer for 25 on that particular thing, you know. And finally it just... It just came that, you know, I read a book that talked about, you know, the pastor said he, he didn't believe that God opened, opened doors for any, any, anyone anymore, but he felt that if you're called to do something, you should just do it, and God doesn't want you to do it, he'll stop you. <laughs> so I took that as my, okay, I'm, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of being angry and excited about all this over the, over the course. And we're going to start the journey, and at any point along this journey, God doesn't want me to be a pastor, then he will stop me. And I received confirmation all along the way. So for the past six years, it's been nothing more than, than confirmation. Yeah. And I can look back on my history and say that although I don't understand the timing of it, the preparation sure. was right. great well, we in preparing remember, me for, for what, I'm, what I'm doing today. David so. was anointed king. He didn't immediately become king. Right. Right. No, he did not. He so was king and waiting for a long, yeah, long time. time <laughs> with a lot of struggles. And, and so all of us have probably that that preparation that and yeah. and each one of us are unique and can minister in those those ways and yeah. so it's just kind of cool i guess the answer for the viewer that wrote the question in how do you know you're called to the ministry you're asking the to, question you probably yeah. are yeah. <laughs> exactly right. very good exactly sorry right. yeah. <laughs> we got to take a quick break we're going to come back with more of the viewer questions from you so stay tuned Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back and we thank you for staying with us. Now to more viewer questions. I have been told horrible things uh, about the images of hell and, uh, but how does anyone really know what it is like? And the same way about heaven, how does anyone know? Who wants to tackle that one? I know you're just all chomping at the bit to get to that one. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll throw a baseline out. I think what really comes down to is whether we believe what the Bible says or not, right? So if we open Bottom up line. God's word, and if God has spoken clearly to us about heaven and hell, then that's our starting point. So, for instance, in Mark chapter 9, verse 48, Jesus describes hell 
as a place where the worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. So to the question, how do, you know, images of hell, you know, Jesus is using an image to describe something so that we can say, wow, that sounds like a terrible place. I don't want to have anything to do with that. But the big message that he's giving us is that there's an eternality to it. That sure. when we move from this life to the next, that location, that destination is our final destination. Um, and then the same with, with heaven as well. So I went to the thief on the cross in Luke 23, when he describes it to this man who knows little about Jesus, um, Jesus just says, hey, today you'll be with, with me in paradise. Paradise is a good image, right? Mm -hmm, this is mm -hmm. because of God's presence, it is good. So I think at first it has, we have to ask the question of whether we believe the Bible or not. Okay. Yeah. And to follow up with that, you know, Jesus tells the, par tells the story about uh, Lazarus and a rich man in Gospel of Luke, you know, where the, where, the, where, the, where Lazarus was begging for food or wanted food from the rich man, and the rich man never, never gave it to him. They both die the same day. There's a divide, you know. The, Lazarus is with Abraham, you know, in a safe, secure place. Lazarus is on the other side asking for water because he, he's, he, he's, he needs quenched. And additionally, the other important part of that story is that immediately we're told that Lazarus was escorted to Abraham, you know, paradise, whatever terminology, translation you want to use, heaven, whatever you want to say, <laughs> by angels. You know, what a great picture that is when we think about, you know, when someone dies to be able to, to be, you know, escorted by angels. And I always say, add loved ones to that too, you know, in, into that place of safety, comfort, peace, you know, and so beats the other side. <laughs> Right. Asking for some water. <laughs> no. So, yeah. You know, the, I think a lot of people that are struggling with these kinds of issues, heaven and hell, are they real or, or not, are, are perhaps people who are either non-believers or they're just new beginners and the like and don't know that we're talking about another world that's outside of this, that, that you can't limit it to what the limitations are in this life, because it's another life altogether. W would you say that's correct? Or well, is that I, what the, we should be thinking of? I, I think so, and, and I appreciate the, the, the comment you made about the eternality of it. There, there is another life after this. These bodies weren't created to be eternal. Our, our soul is what's eternal, and, and there is a destination. You will either be with God or you'll be separated from God. And, and honestly, I think that is the, the worst part, if you will, if we could categorize hell, is knowing that you're there. You're, you, there's no chance. And in the, again, the Bible's very clear about that. It's eternal separation. There, there is no second chance. And, and we will either spend eternity with Christ or we'll spend eternity separated from Christ. And I hear people say, well, I just can't believe that a loving God would send anyone to hell. And the reality of that is God doesn't send anyone there. We, we, the people that end up in hell are there because of their own, their own choice. And C.S. Lewis you know, calls people, the, the people that, that end up in hell for eternity, successful rebels to the end. Right. They, they spend their life shaking their fist at God saying, I will, not, I will not accept you. I will not bow down. And finally, God says, okay. Be, mm -hmm. Being the consummate gentleman, mm -hmm. he never forces himself on anyone. It's a choice. And we either choose to be with him or we choose to be separated from him. And it, just one more thing real quickly about heaven. Mm -hmm. I think the reason why we don't know much about what heaven is like is because we would long to be there. We, we would want to go there and experience that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's why we don't know what heaven will be like. We know it's paradise. We know it's perfect. We know that, that our needs will be met there. Mm -hmm. But if we were to know what heaven was like, we would lose our desire to be here on earth. Well, I'm convinced that none of us truly know, which is not a bad thing because it's, heaven is better than any of us can imagine and hell is worse than what we can imagine. Right. I've always struggled with this because I have a hard time thinking of a reality of a place because we deal in the physical, right? Of streets of gold, pearly gates, the mansion that everybody has, you know, like all that we, we try and talk. And so 
you know, going back to it, we either believe Scripture to be true or not. Well, what is Scripture when you look at it as the whole? It's this love story of redemption of his people. And if it's redemption, God is restoring us. Well, what is he restoring us back to? Well, what it was in Eden. Mm -hmm. And in that, I can grasp my mind around it. Now, I have no idea what the Garden of Eden looked like. I had no idea of all the ins and outs and the freedom that we had, but I can understand the free access that God had to us and us to God. And that's what heaven for me is, mm -hmm. is the ability to have that relationship and ask aspect or, or uh, to God and, and to walk with him, talk with him, to, to have that kind of life, because that is what God is redeeming, because that was his perfect creation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's turn to another subject that I think is somewhat similar. I don't understand the Trinity. How can God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit all be the same person? It's another in that area of the spiritual realm rather than the natural realm. How do we get our arms around that, so to speak, is what everybody talks about when we're dealing with our limited, physical, finite world. How do we do that? Well, I always, um, I mean, you hear different things like, you know, chicken and the egg, the egg you know, it's got the three, whatever. I always look at it from an aspect of uh, the Trinity as we were created in the image of God. And so I have my flesh and my flesh is here, it touches the physical world all the time and it moves. Well, then I also have my mind, and especially when I'm preaching, I, I, I realize I could do this. I can think about other things while I'm actually preaching. You guys do that too, right? Yeah. You know, and if you're talking to your spouse, you're probably very good at this if you're married. You're talking to your spouse, but yet you're thinking about what you're gonna do next, you know, or, not, not you know, honey, not, not you. Honey, honey. Honey. All right, it's just me. You know, so our minds can function outside of our, what our flesh is doing, but then we have our deep desires, our spirits, our souls, in us that longs for something that doesn't not comprehended by our minds but yet is outside of our flesh and I always look at the aspect of learning an instrument or an uh, athlete learning a, a craft so I played guitar and I remember at a time where I had to take one hand and physically move it so that it would do what my mind wanted it to do you know <laughs> yeah. and so when you look at God from those aspects God the Father being the mind that is you know telling and controlling but our flesh can do something different well sure. Jesus was the flesh on the earth mm -hmm. and then our spirit connects with God's spirit and we can't make sense of that all the time but so if we look at ourselves and look at how those things can function we can begin to see just a snippet of what the Trinity really is yeah since we're created in his image. Very good, good point. Well, listen, we're winding down on time. Here's another question I think we probably ought to end on. Um, and it says here, there is a well-known song that says, they will know we are Christians by our love. But these days, it feels like love means always agreeing with others and not making waves. What does it look like to be a real Christian? Pretty good question, I think. Go ahead, Pastor Bob. Yeah, I, I just think it's, it has to do with respect. It has to do with, um, with, with honor. It has to do with, you know, uh, I, I want to be a good listener. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, cut you down and say you're absolutely wrong. I'm right and you're an idiot for not, for <laughs> not believing the way I believe. I mean, that's not how relationships supposed to supposed to go. And we look back at Jesus. You know, he, he had great conversations with people that he didn't agree with, but he brought them along. He was a great listener, mm -hmm. you know, and he loved people. You know, so if we enter into relationships first based upon love, that I'm not going to beat you up. I'm going to love you first mm -hmm. and let's find our common ground. I mean, to me, that, that's where it's at. It's about building relationships with people and knowing that you and I may be a long way apart, but we do have some things in common. Let's try to find those things in common and bring our relationship together. You know, we're not gonna agree on everything and that's okay, you know, but I can still love you, you can still love me, I still got your back, you got my back, you know, that kind of thing. And so that's part of being a Christian is, is that kind of love as well. Pastor Nick, were you going to jump in or what? Yeah, no, I just think one of the things that people want so desperately nowadays is to be heard. And there's so many platforms to speak but you know, you put something on Twitter and you, you know, you submit it, and you're like, did anybody hear that? Does anybody care? Is anybody listening to me? 
such a valuable thing to just sit and say, tell me about yourself. What, what do you love? What do you hate? What are you about? Mm -hmm. um, that can be such a fruitful conversation, even if you don't say anything, you know, just listening. People are expecting that in conversation, we're just waiting for our turn to talk. And so they're amazed when you sit back and you listen and you actively, you know, hear that's, and that can be an expression of love. Mm -hmm. And that can even end with, well, boy, there's some things about your life that don't fit with God's word. And I understand why they don't, um, but I want to be following Christ. Is it okay if I share with you what that looks like? Okay. Well, and again, scripture tells us that, that we're supposed to speak the truth in love. And we do a pretty good job with the first part, but not, maybe sometimes not so much with the second part. You know, we, we forget about speaking the truth in love. And Jesus was, was quite well known for disagreeing with the Pharisees, um, speaking the truth in, in love. Uh, but he also spent a lot of time with people that were far away from, from God. He, he spent time with the tax collectors and the sinners and people that mm -hmm. needed that relationship, someone to come along and the woman caught in adultery. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the religious leaders brought her in front of Jesus, ready to stone her. And Jesus said, all right, whoever around here hasn't committed a sin, you chucked mm -hmm. first rock. Yeah, yeah. And they all, they all went away. To, to her, she, he, he actually, you know, he forgives her. I don't condemn you. But then he also says, now go and don't sin anymore. Don't do it anymore. There's right? an expectation. Have a, yeah, transformed life after that. And, right. and our assumption from the story is that she did. Mm -hmm. That sure, her life was changed because of the grace that was extended to her. Right, but he never said, you did not sin. Right, exactly. You know, the loving thing wasn't making her feel better. Mm -hmm. It was actually drawing it out and making her better. Yeah. And Jesus always went to the point to make and develop and pour into people to better them. And I think that's really what love is not coming in a beating way, like you were saying, hey, we're not gonna come and just beat you up just because, but I care enough about you to tell you the truth because I want you better. Well, there's a, there was a big wow. difference between religious leaders mm -hmm. in the way Nicodemus acted and the way some of the others acted. Right. All right. You know, and, and and Jesus's it. reaction. We're gonna end it on that note. Thank you very much. Very good insights there. Yeah, the upshot, love one another. Okay, thank you very much. We appreciate you being on our program today and uh, also last, uh, last week as well. And to you, our viewers, we hope you'll be tuning in again next week when we'll have another group of panel, uh, another group, I should say, of uh, ministers who will be sharing the gospel by way of your questions. So until then, I'm Bill Harris. Bye-bye for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.